I will determine the irreducible representations of the uh, 12 vibrational modes of this C2H4 ethylene molecule with a D2H point group. And then I will determine which ones are Raman active, which ones are infrared active. So first, in this uh, character table of the D2H point group, there are eight symmetry elements. The identity element, three C2 rotation axis, one inversion center, and three sigma planes. Uh, if we choose the Z axis as the principal axis, and then we have two other C2s perpendicular to this principal rotation axis. And then we have this sigma H perpendicular to the principal axis. And then two more sigmas. Those are sigma Vs that contain the C2 axis. In the uh, D type point group, they are called sigma Ds. And we have eight irreducible representations. For each representation, you have eight uh, numbers here. Those are the corresponding characters. And if we look at this character table, uh, there are plus ones, there are negative ones. Uh, negative ones are in red color. So to determine the vibrational modes of this C2H4, first we count the number of atoms. There are a total of six atoms. And each atom can move in the x, y, or z direction. Therefore, there are a total of 6 times 3 equals 18 motions. And this 18 minus 3 rotations here, and then minus 3 translations. So you have 12 vibrational modes. You may use this symmetry.otabine.edu to take a look at this uh, D2H point group or uh, similar molecules as a thing. So first, we need to determine the number of atoms that remain in the original position after a symmetry operation. And E uh, means uh, doing nothing. So all six atoms remain in the original position. And uh, C2 in the x direction. So we're looking at a C2 axis passing through the center of this molecule. And remember, we just set this uh, direction as the x direction, this direction as the y direction. Therefore, the z uh, axis is perpendicular to the screen. And then if we imagine the uh, ethylene molecule rotates about the C C2, 180 degrees, all six atoms will move away from their original position. So we put zero here. Similarly, if we rotate this molecule about the um, C2 axis in the y direction, so this one, oh, I'm sorry, this one, all six atoms will move away from the original position. Therefore, put another zero here. However, if we do the third C2 in the x direction, this C2, this C2 axis contains this two carbon atoms. Therefore, this two carbon atoms remain in their original position. So I put two here. Inversion center, again, if we do an inversion, uh, all six atoms move away from the original position. How about sigma H uh, uh, on the XY plane? So this is the XY plane. So if we do a reflection with respect to sigma H, okay, none of the six atoms moves away from the original position, only because this sigma H contains all those six, six atoms. So six atoms remain in the original position. How, how about sigma XZ? Okay, you have to uh, imagine a um, sigma V plan here, cutting this C2H4 into two halves. Uh, this sigma V contains two atoms, the carbon atom and the uh, other carbon atom, and then we put number two here. And then finally, there's a, another sigma V. And actually, it's called sigma D in the D2H point group. But again, I mean, if you do a reflection about this symmetry plan, all six atoms 
move away from the original position. So you put zero here. Now you have this row of eight numbers. And then we need to know the characters of x, y, and z. So uh, we simply look for x, y, z here. And then this three is simply the sum of the last three rows that correspond to x, y, and z. So we use the sum function in Excel, and then we drag it through. We got the sum of the characters of x, y, and z. And then we do a simple multiplication. So this is a number of atoms that remain in the original position after a signature operation. And this three uh, is the uh, sum of the characters of x1 and z in the uh, same uh, symmetry column. So we got 6 times 3, we get 18. And then we drag it from left to right. And we get another row as the product of these two rows. Uh, we're not done. We need to multiply this row by the number of symmetry operations in each column. So fortunately, they are just ones. So we basically get the same number here. All right. So this row is exactly the same as this row, only because we have only one symmetry operation in each symmetry operation column. And then we multiply this row with the row of the A1 symmetry here, and then B1G, and then B2G, and then B3G and A U B1 U B2 U B3 U we will we will generate another new table. So again, if we double click this, this is just B dollar seventeen. So it's this cell with the number of rows fixed seventeen here, multiplied by B4. B4 is this one, and then we do the multiplication. We drag it from left to right. And then we drag this row all the way down. We generate a new table. And in the AG row, we have eight numbers. We sum up this eight numbers. Using the sum function, we get 24. And uh, same for B1G. Uh, we sum up all those eight numbers. We get 24 again. And then B2G, we sum up all these eight numbers. We get 16. So basically, we just do the same operation, the sum operation. We drag it down. We got uh, uh, eight numbers here. This eight numbers divided by the order of the D to H point group. So that's eight. We get uh, actually the number of irreducible representations. So again, this three is simply 24 divided by eight. And then we drag this all the way down. Oh, what does this tell us? Simply means we have uh, a total of six atoms, and six times three equals 18 motions. So among these 18 motions, there are three AG, three B1G, two B2G, one B3G, one AU, two B1U, three B2U, three B3U. Now we need to subtract the three translations and the three rotations. So where are those three translations? They are here. So the three translations in the x, y, z directions correspond to B3U, B2U, and B1U. How about rotations? The rotation about the x-axis has a B3G symmetry. Uh, the rotation about y-axis to B2G. The rotation about the z-axis, B1G. So basically, we have to subtract this B1G, B2G, B3G, the three rotations, and B1U, B2U, B3U, the three translations. So that's what we did here. So if we click this, okay, we don't have to subtract AG. We don't have AG as a translation or a translation, but we need to minus this three. Uh, we need to subtract one from the three. We get two B1G, and then this two minus one becomes one. One minus one becomes zero. And then over here, uh, there's no translation or rotation with a AU symmetry. Therefore, just one minus nothing, it's one. And then we have X, Y, Z. So this is Z, this is Y, this is X. So we have two minus one, we get one. Three minus one, we get two. And then three minus one equals two. So really, uh, for the 12 vibrational modes, 
we have three AG vibrational modes, two B1G, one B2G, and then one AU and one B1U, two B2U and two B3U vibrational modes. So we have 12 vibrational modes and among these 12 vibrational modes, actually only six are Raman active, five are IR active, one is neither Raman active nor IR active. What's the reason? It's very simple. Mathematically, you just need to look for X, Y, and Z again. So if you see X, Y, and Z with the B1U, B2U, B3U symmetry, then the vibrational modes with a B1U or B2U or B3U symmetry is infrared active. And then you look at quadratic functions. So we have uh, a total of six quadratic functions here. And this one corresponds to uh, B3G and then XG corresponds to B2G. XY has this B1G symmetry x squared has a ag symmetry y squared has ag symmetry z squared has ag symmetry so if you see those uh, quadratic functions populating uh, this uh, uh, ag b1g b2g b3g uh, column here that means uh, this four irreducible representations are raman active so again it's very simple if uh, actually if you see a g in the irreducible representation, it's going to be Raman active. How about IR active vibrational modes? Well, uh, they should be B1U, B2U, and B3U. What about this AU? So if you look at this AU, you don't see X, Y, or Z here. You don't see any quadratic functions here. That means AU is neither Raman active nor IR active. Now I'm going to show you a uh, web page here. Uh, it's uh, posted uh, by the chemistry department um, of this Purdue University. And I want to show you this AU vibrational mode first because it's neither IR active nor Raman active. So look at this AU. This is AU. This one is AU with a U symmetry with respect to the inversion center. And this is IR inactive, this is Raman inactive, AU. So remember, uh, if we have this AG, B1G, B2G, or B3G, uh, they correspond to this uh, one or more quadratic functions and thus are Raman active. So we'll look at that web, web page. Again, so uh, this is U, so it's Raman inactive. This is G, it's AG. So Raman active, U Raman inactive, U Raman inactive, G Raman active, G Raman active. Again, uh, G Raman active, G Raman active, U Raman inactive, G uh, Raman active, U Raman inactive, U Raman inactive. So how about uh, uh, IR? Uh, you have to have this B1U, B2U, or B3U symmetry to be IR active. So let's look at the web page again. Uh, we're going to look for B1U, B2U, B3U. B1U, infrared, active. So you have a non-zero intensity here. And B2U, IR active. B3G, you see a G here, okay, inactive. And then G, uh, IR inactive. B1U, good, IR active. So again, we're looking for B1U, B2U, B3U. They are IR active. So AG inactive, 3G inactive, B3U, uh, IR active. 2G inactive, AU inactive, B2U active. Again, this intensity is non-zero, that means uh, this vibrational mode is IR active and you will be able to see this peak on the IR spectrum although with a fairly low intensity here. Alright again I mean it's very simple to determine if uh, one vibrational mode is IR active you just look for X Y or Z. 
uh, and then to determine a vibrational mode uh, is um, a Raman active or inactive, you just look for those quadratic functions. And in this particular example, uh, we see one AU vibrational mode uh, uh, on this uh, uh, web page, uh, uh, which is uh, AU over here. This is AU. This is uh, uh, IR inactive and Raman inactive because of this symmetry here. And um, uh, I will explain why this uh, X, Y, Z are IR active, why uh, this are Raman active uh, briefly. So uh, when you are taking an IR spectrum of this molecule, we should be looking for the uh, electric dipole change of the molecule, right? They correspond to you know the uh, the change in x, y, or z, so electric dipole moment here. And if you uh, want to collect the Raman uh, spectrum of this same molecule, you are looking for the change in the uh, polarizability of the molecule, and those are actually the elements in the polarizability matrix of this molecule. And in the end, uh, um, there is a so-called mutual exclusion rule regarding the IR activity and Raman activity for a molecule with an inversion center. So you may have realized that if a molecule contains an inversion center, then X, Y, Z are always anti-symmetric with respect to the inversion center. However, the quadratic functions x squared, y squared, z squared, or xz, yz, xz, they are symmetrical with respect to the inversion center. Simply put, if you change the sign of x and y here, uh, the sign of x times y doesn't change. Okay, and again, if you change the sign of x and z, uh, the product xz remains the same. So same is here and also if you just change the sign of x or y or z, actually you want to change two of those, but again the sign of x squared or y squared or z squared remains unchanged. Alright, so basically I'm just trying to say this, if you have a molecule with a inversion center and then those uh, uh, infrared active vibration modes definitely has a U symmetry. And those Raman active modes definitely has a G symmetry. Therefore, they are mutually exclusive.